In Midsummer Parva, bodies keep dropping. Are they dropping from UFOs? We're talking crop circles. Electrocutions. And the woman problem in this episode of... Welcome to Midsummer. Hello, and welcome to Midsummer, the podcast where we dissect all the mysteries, the murders, and the many weird things about the long-running hit TV show, Midsummer Murders. I'm your host, Eric Busher. With me, as always, is my co-host, the fabulous Eileen Becker. Hey, Eileen. Hey, Eric. I'm fabulous. Today, we are talking about The Electric Vendetta, the third episode of the fourth series. It originally aired September 2nd, 2001. It was directed by Peter Smith and written by Terry Hodgkinson. Let's see what's out there. Spoiler warning, we will be discussing the events of this episode, including the identity of the murderer. So if you haven't watched yet and don't want to know who done it, pause this and go watch it. We will still be here when you get back. Where have you been? I've got to be back in the surgery in five minutes. Lucky to get here at all, my little mouse. There are police crawling all over the big wheat field. Police? What for? They found another body in a crop circle. Are you kidding? Who is it? Well, the police aren't saying, but I've heard it's Eddie Field. That's why Doc Fleming was in such a mood this morning. You know, the first one was electrocuted. Electrocuted? Cooked inside like a steak and kidney pie. What about a little, uh, little nibble for your Uncle Harry? No. No. You can go on, Green. We open at some point in the past? As two men duel with swords? They are going at it. Peter Rhodes, the Marquis of Ross, gets a slice to the face from Sir Christian Subray, the Duke of Joey, knocking him down. Subray claims victory and tries to help Rhodes up, but he ain't having it. Jamais vaincu, he says, and storms off. Cut to a field in modern-day Midsummer Parva. Steve Ramsey is having sexy time with Sally Bolter, and she ain't his wife. They are disturbed by his father-in-law, Sir Henry Chatwin, on a stroll and, I think, talking to his dog we never really see. He walks on to another field that has some huge crop circles in them. As he approaches, he finds a dead, naked body in the center of the circle. Barnaby and Troy show up and talk to random coroner Dr. Michael Rycroft. The unidentified body has scalded hands from where he was electrocuted. Post-mortem puncture wounds right above his butt, and part of his hair has been shaved. Was this body dumped by a UFO? Local ufologist Lloyd Kirby sure thinks so. He shows up with Lady Beatrice Chatwin to snap photos and tries to convince Barnaby that this is the work of aliens, even pressing his book on him. Apparently Parva is crop circle central. After having to stare at the bare derriere of the dead man a couple more times, we find out he's Ronald Stokes, a violent criminal. Why was he there? At the Chatwins, we find a simmering cauldron of bitterness. Harry and Beatrice are on opposite ends of the UFO question, and neither of them seem thrilled with son-in-law Steve, who seems to make their daughter Lucy both miserable and turned on. Probably doesn't help that Harry is also sleeping with Sally out in a cottage on their land. Like father-in-law, like son-in-law, I guess. He tries to get her to stop seeing Steve, but Sally will see who she darn well wants. Barnaby and Troy question Lloyd. The condition of Stokes' body is similar to photos in his book of other abductees, and they accuse him of finding the body and using it to further the crop circle story. Lloyd's alibi is Lady Chatwin. An older Sir Christian shows up to pay Lloyd's bail. Apparently he's done this for Lloyd in the past. That evening, Joyce isn't too thrilled to find out the hot date Tom is taking her on is a, to a talk Lloyd is giving on UFOs. Don't blame her. The talk looks like a one-man show in a black box theater, complete with a heckler, Harry, who accuses Lloyd of making the circles. Tom and Joyce duck out early to get a drink, but they are interrupted by Troy. He tells them that a couple of randy teens tried to have sex in a second crop circle and found a different body. It's another naked guy in the same condition as Stokes. Troy recognizes this corpse as local burglar Eddie Field. They trace him back to an old foundry where Field and associate Dave Rippert would try to melt down stolen gold and silver. They don't find any stolen merchandise, but they do find evidence that Eddie was killed there, electrocuted while trying to steal juice for the foundry. How did he end up in the crop circles? Troy goes over to Dave's, who has an alibi, a bunch of stolen merch, and a visitor. Sally! She agrees to help Dave hide the loot at her place, but they are seen by the sisters who run the local store, who report them snitches. Beatrice tells Barnaby that she and Lloyd were childhood sweethearts. 
but her parents wanted to marry above her station and got his family to ship him off. She was forced to marry Harry and see how well that turned out. Sally and Steve finish up another date in the field while someone watches them. Steve heads to his truck. When he tries to start it, he is electrocuted to death in a big, shiny blue haze. So a little bit of tourist info. Eileen, tell us about Midsummer Parva. Well, this is our first visit to Midsummer Parva, though we will return five more times in Murder on St. Mally's Day, The Straw Woman, Shot at Dawn, Secrets and Spies, and The Sword of Guillaume. Devington is a snooty private school with lots of secrets. There was a straw woman festival in which an effigy and a few people got the wicker man treatment. A pornographer once lived in one of the local manor houses. They also have a nice hospice, a World War I memorial, the obligatory old church, and Allenby House, a safe house for spies. It's a busy little village full of murderous people. Seriously, just do not move here. So what is Parva? The word exists in several languages, but the Latin definition is little. From there, it entered Spanish and Galician, where in addition to meaning a small breakfast, it also was used for unthreshed grain. So it's either uh, midsummer grain or little midsummer. (laughs) Little midsummer. (laughs) Little big midsummer. (laughs) Yeah, I think the the grain part, you know, because of the crop circles is kind of fitting. Yeah. So my main thought on this episode, Eileen, why are there so many naked men in this one? <laughs> and why are there none of them Jones? Yeah. Aren't we glad we only see the backside of any of Like, we see multiple naked man butts in this episode. It, uh, it was a little <laughs> weird. It's not, because so, it's not something we normally see in Midsummer. It was very, it was very distracting. <laughs> <laughs> There is a bit of more, there's a bit more leniency with nudity in British TV than there is with an American TV. I I understand that. And I am fine with that. But Midsummer is not a show that really has any nudity for a show that is also very sexy at a lot of times. It's very, Mm -hmm. and violent sex, like sex and nudity, like for nudity, it's very chaste. So to see all the man butts, was a little shocking. Well, we we do get that glimpse of Jones in the shower. <laughs> that's your that's your wallpaper. Um, it may be. <laughs> it's a little distracting and weird, especially like going forward. It's not something that continues on uh, too much in in the show. And also the fact that crop circles seem to make everybody in this part of the t- real horny. <laughs> so what's up with the chat wins? That is a miserable family. Uh, what was Hemingway's quote about, or was it uh, Fitzgerald's quote about all happy families are happy in the same way and all miserable families are miserable in their own way? I can't. Anyway, but they are very miserable. Yeah. Nobody really seems to love each other in this family, except ma- like I've, the mother clearly loves the daughter. Yeah. And I think the dad loves the daughter in a way, but when he, he doesn't seem to care about it. Like he seems to care more about Sally than anything. Yeah. The daughter sort of bounce. Like I, I thought the daughter was like, sort of like, we didn't really get to spend any time with her this episode. And then basically she bounces back and forth between, I hate my husband, but I also love to have sex with my husband. Yeah. Yeah. She's not as well developed as a lot of characters normally are. She, she is a bit of a cipher and she does kind of fall into just the trope of, you know, the ignored and and i you know i don't think she's physically abused but he seems to verbally abuse her yeah he's very controlling and domineering he's Mm -hmm. he's he's the textbook definition of a toxic man yeah he is portrayed as sort of the the town stud i guess i don't know not a great dude yeah there are a lot of toxic men in this one oh god yes uh except for except for lloyd yeah poor sweet lloyd as this episode centers around the phenomenon of crop circles, Eileen, why don't you take us to the history of crop circles in your history corner? Hi, I'm Jim. And I am Steve. From Jim and Steve Watch a Show. Every week we pick the first episode of a unique and interesting show and review it for you. Have you ever wanted to see a show about intimidating revolving doors, weird marble kisses, Horse dancing silk ribbon montages. Awkward alien encounters. Excessive head slapping. 
mermen with water guns. If any of that sounds intriguing to you, give our show a try. We're available on most podcast platforms. Hope to see you there. Are crop circles made by intergalactic Banksies to confuse and confound ignorant humans? Let's peek into the history of this older-than-you-would-expect phenomenon. Some seriologists or crop circle investigators debate if the first record of a crop circle is from a 1678 news pamphlet called The Mowing Devil or Strange News Out of Hertfordshire. The woodcut on the frontispiece shows a strange creature reaping a field of oats with a scythe and a circular pattern. The text says that a farmer, too cheap to pay a human laborer to mow his field, swore that he'd rather the devil mowed it. That night his field seemed to be in flames, but the next morning the entire field was neatly mown. Was it Satan? At least the cheap farmer got it done for free. Though rare, when crop circles did crop up over the next few centuries, it was often attributed to fairy rings, which are caused by mushrooms or other fungi, or cyclonic winds. Sightings started to become a little more frequent in the 20th century, often attributed to air currents, downdrafts, lightning, and the occasional meteor. Things started to change as the UFO craze really took off in the middle of the 20th century. In the 1960s, circular formations in swamp reeds and sugarcane fields in Australia and Canada were reported. In 1966, a farmer in Tully, Australia claimed to see a flying saucer rise from a swamp and when he investigated, he found that the reeds had been flattened in clockwise curves. Investigators put it down to a dust devil or water spout with the saucer just being debris. By the 1980s, you couldn't toss a pet rock without hitting a crop circle. They were everywhere, all over the world, but especially concentrated in the Wiltshire region of England. This area is home to the Salisbury Plain, where Stonehenge and the Avebury Stone Circles are. This has led many seriologists to connect the ancient structures to the crop circles in a sort of mystical alien druid hoodoo. They somehow tie into ley lines, which are straight lines connecting various historical structures and landmarks. Mystical energy and all that. The designs grew more sophisticated and complex as time went on. So what was causing them? The increasingly intricate patterns indicated that this new batch of crop circles weren't weather-related, unless, of course, tornadoes or ball lightning became sentient and artistic. Could it be mushrooms or other fungi? Are we headed to the world of the last of us? Not likely. Unless, of course, fungi became artistic and started caring what humans were looking at rather than just turning them into fungi zombies. Could animals be evolved? There was a report from Tasmania that wallabies had created crop circles in fields of opium poppies. Apparently, they had eaten the opium-laden poppies and run around in circles. But I doubt that drugged-out wallabies were roaming the world and created massive amounts of crop circles. Though I could be wrong. Is it a message from God, gods, or the Earth itself sending us a message about global warming? There has to be a less cryptic way for a deity to make its opinion known, like smiting a few oil executives and coal barons. So that leaves man-made or paranormal. Are the crop circles just landing strips for the TARDIS? It's the doctor, right? Eh, no, sadly it's not the doctor. He doesn't need a la any landing strip when he can plop his police box down anywhere. Though I did come across a suspicious police box in a field in the Cotswolds once. Still, ufologists have argued that there was no way that the crop circles could be man-made. The crops were flattened, not cut or reaped. The patterns were too complex. There was strange radiation at a few of the sites, and the patterns were getting more and more complex. Surely that means that an otherworldly intelligence is evolved, right? Not really. Just two blokes with a post, some rope, a plank of wood, and a sense of humor was all it took. In 1991, a year after an intricate crop circle appeared on the cover of the Led Zeppelin box set, Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley confessed to making more than 200 crop circles since the late 1970s, inspired by the Tully Australia incident. Doug had lived in Australia at the time, then returned to England and struck up a friendship with fellow artist Dave. As Dave put it, one evening, he said, well, at this time, I guess it was 1978, and the UFO phenomenon was right there in Wiltshire, so we thought, uh, well, we'll try one in the field, so we put one down. We did this for two years, and nothing came of it, so we decided then, what we'll be doing is putting them down in sites right under the view of the general public. So, near Winchester, in Hampshire, in England, there's this 
a hill called Chief's Foothead with a great view from a height down into a down. So we put one down there, and it was taken up by Mr. Pat Delgado, and from then on it took off. Soon crop circles became all the rage. Copycats sprung up all over the world. As technology grew, the patterns became more intricate, and a whole industry grew up around creating designs in crops, sands, forests, and such. Advertising, baby! Everything is a billboard. Still, there are some true believers who admit that while many of the crop circles are man-made, not all of them are. So maybe Doug and Dave started a conversation with aliens, and the aliens are now responding. That would have been a much more interesting movie than Signs. Now we'll go into more depth on UFOs when we discuss the season 18 episode, The Incident at Cooper Hill. What I took from that is that there is a place called Cheese Foothead. Yes. I want to go to there. <laughs> so this episode does exist at a time when people know how crop circles are made, and Barnaby references it quite clearly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I have watched videos of them making these and it takes a lot of planning, but it, the process is simple. But yeah. the laying out of the pattern is is very very intricate. And um, but you know it's much easier now with technology like drones that can help do this. Really strange kill in this episode. Midsummer has a history of electrocutions, but this truck one is violently brutal. Yeah, yeah. Pretty graphic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, even like, you see Sir Harry's face when he like he sees he has to go identify the body, and even he is aghast. Um, yeah. But it, it, I was just like the 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 violent nature of that with the blue light. It was really, really hardcore. Now, fun with science in this episode because electricity and electrocution does play a role in this. So, in the second half, there's a uh, Barnaby and Troy are trapped inside a house that has been electrified, and they. You see them testing the door handles and the telephone, and they can't touch them because of electricity. So, however, a couple of things in this are not right. So when they reach for the door handles, the electricity that passes through their arms would cause the retraction muscles, uh, overpowering the protraction muscles, which are weaker, in their forearms to cause their hands to close in the fist. But they do not. They, we see their hands continue to be outstretched. However, later in the episode, someone else is also trapped in that place. And their hand actually gets the effect right. Secondly, the wiring and telephones would not be able to handle a dangerous electric current. It would short out the phone. Not to mention that the phone is made out of plastic, which is an insulator. So they could have picked up the phone and called. Yeah, they could. Have, they also could have used the golf club because it had that rubber handle mm -hmm. on it to pull the handle down and open the door. Yep. So it, it, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, so, although there was interesting science in this episode, they didn't quite get the science right. And that's why we all watch Midsummer, to, So they get For the, the science. science. Uh-huh. <laughs> Cast highlights. Eileen, you want to kick us off? Yeah. Let's start with Patrick Bellotti, who played extra crispy sexual dynamo Steve Ramsey. His most recognizable role is the in the original office, playing Neil Godwin, the nemesis of Ricky Gervais's David Brett. He also appeared in Stella... Mistresses, Richard Jones, The Edge of Reason, Bodies, Identity, Marcella, Light of Duty, Readers, and most recently in Ted Lasso. He plays in a band called Grow Up with the actor Keith Allen, father of Alfie and Lily Allen. Uh, he also loves chocolate and potato chips and is bad with his finances, according to an article, 10 Things You Didn't Know About Patrick Bellotti. Daisy Bates was Lucy Ramsey. She comes from an acting family. Her father was Ralph Bates, who appeared in the 70s Poldark series, and her mother, Virginia Witherall, who played Dracula's wife in the Jack Palance Dracula. Daisy's first role was in the show Island, and then she appeared in See You Friday, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, with her final role in the short film Hero. It looks like she's retired, although there's not a lot of information out there on the internet. Fun fact, she is a descendant of Louis Pasteur. Alison Fisk was our gentle lady Beatrice Chatwin. She is probably best known for her starring role in Helen, A Woman of Today, an ahead-of-its-time TV series about a woman choosing to move on from her cheating husband rather than an attempt to rebuild. She won an Olivier Award for her role as Fish in the play Dusa, Fish, Stas, and Bai. She loved the theater and performed with the RSC a number of times, as well as tons of plays, all the way up to a London production of A Man for All Seasons in 2006. 
She appeared sporadically on TV until she retired in 2008, but one notable TV project was a TV movie version of Tis a Pity She's a Whore. Amanda Mealing was femme fatale Sally Bolter. She's best known for playing the character Connie Beauchamp in both Holby City and Casualty. She played Beauchamp originally from 2004 to 2010, and then again from 2014 to 2021. Now, her first professional role was in a Julie Andrews TV special at the age of six. Over the years, she's appeared in Grange Hill, Four Weddings and a Funeral, The Bill, Strike Back Project Dawn, and Death in Paradise. More recently, she's switched to TV directing, doing episodes of Coronation Road and the most recent series of Waterloo Road. She's also a breast cancer survivor and does a lot of charity work for the organization Breast Cancer Care. Alec McCohen played Master Electrician Sir Christian Aubrey. He also had a career that went back decades. His stage debut was in 1942 as Mickey in Patty, The Next Best Thing. He would have a lengthy career on stage, both acting and directing. On film, he was in the classic The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, the less classic Frenzy by Hitchcock, Never Say Never Again, Henry V, The Age of Innocence, and in his final film role, Gangs of New York. He retired from acting after that. I guess two times with Daniel Day-Lewis, and he was out. He passed away in 2017. Ursula Howells is Lady Isabel Aubrey in what would be her final film role. She was a noted character actress who started working in the mid-40s. She has a long list of credits, including the Alec Guinness classic The Horse's Mouth, Young and Willing, The Foresight Saga, Bergerac, Lovejoy, Dangerfield, and The Cazalets. According to Wikipedia, she was known for her elegant presence. No attribution to that. She passed away in 2005. Charmaine May played Lloyd Stan, Miss Marion Leonard. She also appeared in The Good Life, You're Only Young Twice, Keeping Up Appearances, Highlander Endgame, and Bridget Jones' Diary. After Midsummer, she appeared in 11 episodes of Weird Sister College as the character Alicia Thunderblast, which should go on her tombstone, as she passed away in 2002. (laughs) Michael Burtonshaw played temporary coroner Dr. Michael Rycroft. He is a character actor who appeared in Bellman and True, C.A.B., the original Traffic miniseries, Lovejoy, October, The Lost World, William & Mary, The Da Vinci Code, The Crown, and most recently, Grace. Peter Penry Jones was Peter Rhodes, the Marquess of Ross, a Welsh actor from Cardiff. He appeared in The Professionals, Bergerac, lots of Bergerac in this episode, Superman 4, The Quest for Peace, Poirot, Longitude, and his final role in the show Bombshell. He was married to the actress Angela Thorne, who also appeared on Midsummer Murders. He passed away in 2009. Simon Quarterman had a small role as young Sir Christian Aubrey. This was an early role for him. Previous to this, he had played young Walter in Perfect Strangers and young Prince Albert in Victoria and Albert. But after this, he would go on to Holby City, The Scorpion King 2, The Devil Inside, Estranged, and his most prominent role to date as the narrative director Lee Sizemore in the HBO series Westworld. Playing young Peter Rhodes is Lawrence Penry Jones, son of Peter Penry Jones. His most prominent role is Dr. Oliver Berg in the show Doctors. He also appeared in The Foresight Saga, Waking the Dead, and The Bill. Apparently, he retired from acting to be an ambulance driver. Again, that's from Wikipedia, so who knows if it's true. He's married to the actress Polly Walker, who has had an extensive career, but never did Men's Summer, so really, what is it all for? Now let's meet our return visitors. John Woodvine played our frequently sick, wink wink, Sir Henry Chatwin. He later appeared in The Oblong Murders. He's another actor with quite the resume, having appeared in over 70 theater productions and around that many film and TV productions. Humble brag, he played Banquo in Macbeth opposite Ian McKellen and Judy Dench in the acclaimed Trevor Dunn production, as well as Claudius to McKellen's Hamlet in a 1970 TV production. He appeared in Ken Russell's classic The Devils, Z Cars, The Avengers, An American Werewolf in London, Wuthering Heights, Persuasion, Vanity Fair, The Crown, and currently in a film called Ennis Men. In 1979, his voice was used in two television commercials at the same time, one promoting Scottish and Newcastle Breweries beer, and the other on the abusive drink for the Health Education Council. His wife, Lynn Fairley, is also visited her midsummer, having been in the episode picture of innocence. Nigel Harrison was silver enthusiast Dave Ripper. He was also in Death in a Chocolate Box. I was excited because I thought 
it was the Nigel Harrison who used to play with the band Blondie. But no, this Nigel is a character actor who appeared in Christopher Columbus, The Discovery, The Lifeboat, Touch of Frost, Foil's War, The Green Green Grass, and most recently in Silent Witness. Joni Broom played the blink and you will forget he's there David Hedges. He also appeared in the episode Death of a Stranger. He had smaller roles in Band of Brothers, Casualty, The Afternoon Play, Doctors, and Dalziel and Pasco. According to the web, he's now an entrepreneur, so good luck to you. Marilina Kendall was ufologist Hollick, Miss Alice Leonard. She later appeared in Murder by Magic. She's a prolific character actress, appeared in 1984, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, The Reader, Billy Elliot, Tessa the Durbervilles, and Doctors. Our village star this week, and that's almost a pun, is Kenneth Colley for playing ufologist Lloyd Kirby. Colley had a 60-year career in film and television, starting in 1960 in A for Andromeda as the uncredited role of Dead Body. From humble beginnings came appearances in How I Won the War, Performance, The Devils, Mahler, Lizdomania, Jabberwocky, Ripping Yarns, Monty Python's Life of Brian as Jesus, Firefox, Pennies from Heaven, Vera, Misfits, and Peaky Blinders. But what he is best known for by all Star Wars fans is his role as Admiral Piet in The Empire Strikes Back and The Return of the Jedi. He is the only actor to play an Imperial officer in two Star Wars films. Most of them get murdered by Darth Vader. But Piet dies when a TIE fighter crashes into the bridge of his Star Destroyer. Apparently, he wasn't supposed to be in Jedi, but people actually wrote fan letters to George Lucas about his character, so Lucas decided to include him. He is also perhaps the only actor to have played both Jesus Christ and Adolf Hitler, but not at the same time. Uh, I, th I think? I don't know. Gives a wonderful, gentle performance as Lloyd in this, in this episode. Yeah, I, I very much enjoyed his performance as Lloyd, his portrayal of him as as a believer, as someone who is really, who has found a way to cope with what has been some pretty awful things that have happened in his life through mm -hmm. the UFO beliefs and everything. And he was also, I mean, I definitely remembered him as Admiral Piat uh, because he was, he, he, you don't always have standout actors in these smaller roles but he really did stand out yeah he had he had a sense of there was a, there was a little subtle sense of humor to his like his responses to, to vader and, and empire which i think is what made him what made people really enjoy him so. yeah there were there was stuff he did off script that was really really good yeah i really can't believe that no one has made close encounters of the midsummer kind as a as a real book <laughs> <laughs> It needs to be. It does. It does. We're going to take a break here, and we're going to be back with the second half of The Electric Vendetta. And we're back. Let's talk about the second half of The Electric Vendetta. So what do you think happened in the wheat field then, sir? I believe that someone took advantage of the situation, and poor Lloyd swallowed it. Hook, line, and saucer. <laughs> What's your opinion of Lloyd's beliefs, Lady Isabel? All men are credulous animals. We must all believe in something. Lloyd finds the truck with Steve's cremains and tells the police he knows that this one, this one's murder. Harry identifies the body and almost throws up while Mom comforts Lucy. Barnaby finds a similar death in Lloyd's book and believes someone is using the alien abduction stories to cover up their crimes. Barnaby finds a power substation right next to the truck that was broken into. While Troy goes to talk to Sally, Barnaby goes to talk to the Leonards, who fill him in about Harry's tryst with Sally, who flirts with Troy to cover up the stolen merch. She's also not that broken up by Steve's death. They all head to the Black Box Theater for a town meeting led by the local priest who blames the deaths on Satan. And Lloyd blames innocent aliens, except for that third one. That was, that was clearly murder, says Lloyd. Seems like the villagers mostly think it was Satan. Harry walks off, and after not helping Barnaby with some questions, he meets with Sally, who asks if she can keep some stuff at his cottage. Meanwhile, Sir Christian sits with his wife, Lady Isabel, in a care facility. She knows she is dying and wants to go home before she passes. She also wants to settle some unfinished business by asking for Peter's forgiveness. Barnaby stops by to talk about Lloyd, but takes a greater interest in all the science apparatus around their house. He's so interested that he and Troy decide to return later to search the place, 
without a warrant. They get inside, but find themselves trapped by a security system that violently electrifies all the doors and the phone. After Sir Christian comes home from the hospice, he lets them out, calling them out on their illegal search, but agrees to talk to him. Lloyd confines to Beatrice that he made the original cop circle and put Stokes' body in it. He made the marks on Stokes' body to make it look like aliens, but didn't actually kill him. He was helping someone out and wanted to make more people take UFO abductions seriously. She is understanding and tells him to wait for her at their cottage. When he gets there, he finds Sally and the stolen merch in his room. He attempts to leave, but Dave shows up and throws him down the stairs, killing him. Poor Lloyd. At the station, we get the first reveal. Christian's alarm system killed Stokes, who had been sent there to kill him, and it's not the first time someone's tried to murder Christian. Forty years ago, Christian and his best friend Peter both fell for young Isabel and decided a duel for her, hence the duel we see at the beginning. Christian won, but Peter swore revenge and has been living in his Scottish distillery ever since, getting drunk and sending assassins at him. <laughs> Christian has managed to trap them with his alarm system, but Stokes' weak heart caused him to die. Barnaby knows Lloyd moved the body, but they are interrupted with the news that Lloyd's body has been found in a crop circle. Barnaby and Troy go to Harry to tell him about Lloyd's death, and he is visibly shaken. He had no real hate towards Lloyd, but as he talks, he lets slip that he is responsible for a death. Barnaby puts it together for the second reveal. Harry killed Steve, and while it would have been nice that he did it for his suffering daughter, it was because of Sally. Steve's truck was originally parked closer to the power substation, and Harry just hooked up jumper cables from the truck to it. Once the deed was done, he moved the truck to cause confusion. When Beatrice and Lloyd come home, Henry admits what he did, and Barnaby tells them of Lloyd's passing. Peter comes to town in his fancy roadster and breaks into Christian's cottage, because that is the fun thing to do. Surprise! It's still electrified. Christian and Barnaby come by to let him out, where he pretty much admits he sent Stokes. <laughs> the arrogance of rich white guys. Christian lets him know that Isabel is dying and they all go to the hospice like a family. Peter asks for forgiveness, you know, for the attempted murders and stuff. And he also says goodbye, as does Christian. Beatrice tells Barnaby that Lloyd was going to the cottage. So he and Troy pull up to see Dave and Sally loading up the stolen merch to escape to Holland. While Troy runs after Sally, Barnaby and Dave engage in a back roads car chase. Dave thinks he's escaped when he rounds a corner and runs straight into a combine harvester. Dave goes through the window, dying instantly. I assume Sally goes to jail. We never see, we never really see Peter going to jail either. But we do see Lloyd's funeral, with Beatrice placing a flying saucer on top of the coffin. That is just way too big for the grave. <laughs> Godspeed, Lloyd. Godspeed. Even though in a complicated episode, they still missed a reveal. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> they never explain what happened to Eddie Field and how, he, if he died in the foundries, who made the marks and who moved the body. Now, assuming it was Dave, how would he know the marks? Assuming it was Lloyd, how did he know Eddie was at the foundry? Yeah. Producers later reveal that they just forgot the explanation in the edit. <laughs> who made the other crop circles? Lloyd fesses up to doing the first one. Yep. Yeah, but the second one was definitely different, and... You know, Lloyd could have been found in the first one, but it's hard to tell. And there are some differences in that one as well. So it's there are crop circles everywhere. Yeah, this is the, they left a few things off. Um, and so there's some little bit of sloppy editing, because I believe you see Stokes fingers twitch. As, as he's supposed to be dead. His fingers still twitch a little in the, in the opening. It's just leftover ele electricity. So we had multiple killers in this episode, none of which are really in sync. None of them were working in tandem. They just all sort of happened yeah which is kind of scary if you think about it it's like two people actually commit murder not connected in the same little village at the same time where and the third one was a guy who was trying to commit a murder but got killed yeah <laughs> that's a lot of murder that's a lot of murder <laughs> a lot of murder it is midsummer <laughs> yeah. i do think the thing with with christian and and peter i don't quite understand how that worked so peter keeps sending hitmen who all fail, but none of them ever really report back why. Like, did none of them just say, oh, yeah, he has this electrified house? Yeah. Why were they just always trying to kill him in the house? You know, there's a lot of places to die in Midsummer. Where's a wheel of cheese when you need one? <laughs> Run him off the road. Yeah. I just don't understand how multiple assassins fail to kill anyone in Midsummer. Yeah. Like, 
You breathe and someone gets murdered. <laughs> <laughs> also, Peter basically admits to attempted murder. Yeah. Did he get arrested? He was put in the back of a police car. Uh, I Somebody that rich would have said, I'm sorry, I'm going to call my solicitor right now. Mm -hmm. This episode is really bad with how they treat women. They are more objects, except for Beatrice, who, who really has uh, kind of her own life and her own agency. The other, Sally is just... She's sexually liberated, but yeah. she's also really okay with murder. Yeah, she just looks over the, you know, the, the, the banister and says, like, oh, huh, is he dead? Yeah. Lucy, as we mentioned before, seems to enjoy the sex with her husband, so she's okay with the verbal abuse. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry, but Isabel started that duel. Yeah. Like, we see in the flashback, she just, they're all together, she just kisses both of them. Yeah. Like, she knows. And then she's like, at the end of, the end of her life, she's like... I feel kind of bad about this. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> After the multiple assassins trying to kill your husband, you just now feel bad about it? Yeah. 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 It was just not, not a lot of, like, just, and then you had, like, the two sisters who were, who loved Lloyd, but they were also, like, you know, spies, snitch, gossips. Mm-hmm. Just not a lot of flattering portrayals of women. Nor men. I mean, they're kind of, Nor like, they're, yeah, they're, like I said, they're all, other than Lloyd, pretty toxic. Yeah. Yeah, hmm. it's ever perfect. Kind of a kind of, kind of a crappy place. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see Dave's death coming? Well, I mean, they had to bring back the combine harvester at some point. Yeah, I mean, we see the com like Troy and Barnaby almost run into the combine harvester early in the episode, and I and I looked at that and I was like, well, that's going to be Chekhov's combine harvester. Yeah, yeah. As Chekhov said, you can't have a combine harvester in Act One without ha being used in Act Three. Yeah. <laughs> What was that about Lloyd smuggling heroin in Rangoon? Yeah, I couldn't tell if he was just like the dumb guy that they gave a package to and said, hey, this is uh, a package of, uh, I don't know, washing powder. powder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you give it to my girlfriend in Rangoon? And he got caught. So no. is there's there's so much like it definitely feels this definitely feels like they had way too much in this episode to really try to keep straight and just things just got just dropped. Yeah, it, it got it was a little overstuffed. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, structurally, there are some similar similarities to Judgment Day uh, with the opening scenes, which are set several decades in the past and then several appear threads that appear and disappear. But it just doesn't cohere as much as that episode did. That that episode had a much straighter line, yeah. Uh, narrative line. This was all of, and also one killer, yeah. So, yeah. Let's look at the detective work in this episode. Warrantless searches are back. <laughs> Barnaby just likes to snoop. He's just a nosy man. I, you know, I, after having watched all the Bergerac episodes, where he's basically a bit of a rogue cop, you get. A little bit, uh, yeah, and, you know, and he's, he, that's a 10 series thing. So mm -hmm. that ends about seven years before he picks up being Tom Barnaby. So yeah. you still, you know, I feel like he, he left Jersey, changed his name to Tom Barnaby, but still likes the occasional warrantless search. <laughs> here's what I, here's what I thought was funny. So when they get caught in Christian's place, mm -hmm. Barnaby tells Troy to call the police station, have them come let them out of this place. Which is like, so everybody in Costin PD knows that he does warrantless searches and is just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> oh, it's Barnaby again. He needs us to go get him out of a sticky situation. <laughs> that thin blue wall. Yeah. <laughs> that blue wall covering up war criminal warrantless searches. Yeah. And Christian was right to call him out on it. Yes. Um, also, at one point, Barnaby did say did say the line, get that straw tested. <laughs> I was like, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. What did you think about Troy in this episode? Uh, he's, he's, he's getting better. Um, that there is one thing I do like with, with him is that he, he does grow as a detective and as a person mm -hmm. for the series. He still is a bit tactless. Yeah. Uh, but he does have his moments and he does become a better detective throughout the season. So that by the time you get to the green man, you actually do 
like him as a police officer and as a detective. Yeah, I mean, he, he's still pretty. He, he, like, he still thinks he's some kind of smooth operator. Like, he he, you could tell. Like, he thought Sally was into him. Yeah. Coroner, coroner. So who was that guy? <laughs> I don't know. They never explain. Like, so oh, I see. Uh, uh, Bullard is on vacation, and we have his backup. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Bullard went to the county doctor CSI course. Yeah. This is the other guy. <laughs> yeah. And of course he was like, maybe, maybe Bullard was like, I don't want to be around all these naked man butts. <laughs> and then home life, another top notch date night. <laughs> As they always are. I love the way she just like rolls her eyes and gives him the keys. <laughs> I think I would have been like, Oh, we're, we're going to that. I'm going to stay home. I'm going to read a book. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm just gonna net chill, Netflix and chill for one. Yeah, yeah. She should know the by now that if she's gonna go out with Tom for any kind of event, that something's gonna happen and she's gonna be driving home alone. But at the very end, you know, Tom is going through his junk, and we see some really cool Dan Dare comics. Yeah, from like the '50s. That honestly, those were mint condition. Those could have been worth some money. Yeah, Joyce. Joyce was right. She's gonna make a mint off those. Oh yeah. She, Joyce, Joyce is the real smart one in that relationship. <laughs> so, final thoughts. I, you know, it's like I said, it's an episode that has a lot going on. A lot didn't make it into the final cut that should have made it into the final cut, and I, I think it could have been a more streamlined episode. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the, the, the missing explanation has great shades of the Big Sleep by uh, um, Raymond Chandler. Ray, but, yep. Basically, by Raymond Chandler, but also the film directed by Howard Hawks. Apparently, when they were adapting the film or adapting the book into that film, uh, Hawks noticed that there was no explanation for he couldn't find an explanation for who murdered one of the characters, and he took it to Chandler. And Chandler was like, "Huh, that's a good question. I don't know." <laughs> so, so Eddie will forever be just an unanswered uh, uh, loose end. Yeah, and I also think that. Lloyd's murder was a bit unnecessary. I mean, at that point, he and there's a chance for Lloyd and Beatrice, and it gets taken away for really no reason. I thought Lloyd's was the tragedy in it. I yeah, like like the first two guys, we don't know anything about, but when we find them, they're like, it's basically it sounds like Dumb and Dumber got killed. Yeah, and Steve was horrific, and while his manner of death was horrific, I don't like no only his daughter was really missing him and. Seemingly just for the sex. Yeah. So, uh, but Lloyd was the thing that kind of give, gives this episode emotional weight and gives it sort of a tragedy. And, you know, the the whole thing is about tragic affairs of the heart, right? Peter yeah. is, you know, Peter is resentful over losing Isabel to the point that he's just constantly drunk and okay. sending assassins. And Beatrice is clearly heart sick over, like, she clearly loves Lloyd. Yeah. And never gets that chance. Yeah. Even Henry, in his own way, seems to really, like, I don't know if he loved Sally, but definitely was possessive over her in a way that he just didn't even care about his own family. Yeah. And which might be as close to love as he could get. Yeah, it was just, there was a sadness to this that the murder of Lloyd brought. And I guess, you know, that gave it emotional depth to it, because otherwise we wouldn't have cared about any of the victims. I just found it very sad that at the end there when Lloyd and, and Beatrice had a chance that it was snatched away by such a horrible person for such a stupid reason. Agreed. Agreed. It was a tragedy, but I enjoyed this episode. Mm-hmm. It's, it's fun. It's wacky. Too many naked butts, but just, just is a lot going on and it, it's just kind of primo classic midsummer. Yeah. Weird title though. I don't like the title. Yeah. Yeah, it it ties in with the house and not really the overall arching theme of the UFOs and the... Well, you know, no, it doesn't tie in, but, you know, Henry's vendetta against Steve. Yeah. That electrocution. But yeah, it's just a weird... It's like, I think it was like, oh, we're going to call this the electric vendetta. It's like, that sounds like the name of Dr. Teeth's band from The Muppet Show. That was the Electric Mayhem, and their new show is quite good. (laughs) All right. Uh... Well, that's everything we wanted to talk about. We want to thank you all for listening. And if you have any questions for us about the electric vendetta, or you want to anything you want to discuss about that or midsummer murders in general, feel free to email us at welcome to midsummer at gmail.com. Uh, if you want us to use that email in the show, 
just say so in the email. Uh, we are also welcome to Midsummer on Facebook and Instagram. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing to us or rating and reviewing us on iTunes. It really helps people find us. Also, tell all your friends about us. We will be back soon with another episode, so we hope you will join us again. And as we take the road out of Midsummer, we want to thank you for listening and remind you that in Midsummer, alarm systems can be murder. Yeah, get security cameras instead. Welcome to Midsummer, produced by Eric Busher and Eileen Becker. All clips in this podcast are used in compliance with the U.S. Copyrights Act Fair Use Exemption for Criticism and Commentary. Our logo and podcast art was designed by Smidre. Our theme music is by the infamous Space. Space.